This is Spartan 117. Anyone hear me? Over. Isolate that signal. Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. Welcome back to Finish the Fight, a Halo podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Reiners. And I'm your host, Alex Kendall. And as always, let's go through some of the updates that have been going on within the Halo universe lately. And and really, the only thing that's been going on, at least notable, is that Halo 4 flight testing for PC is starting here soon. Yeah, so there's no official date with it yet, but Xbox and the Halo Twitters have put out that you know, with the MCC dev team working on it, that we will hopefully be getting it here soon, possibly in the time that this podcast comes out, possibly after, who knows. But yeah, it was just released as of recording this podcast, I think a day or two ago. So Mm-mm. we'll probably start to see that come out and then we'll have, you know, the whole family, whole family together <laughs> on PC. Yeah, and then Shadows of Reach is coming out here very soon, just another thing to touch on. But other than that, as you know, I said, it's just we're seeing some more marketing push from Infinite, but other than that, not too much going on right now Mm -hmm. with that being said let's talk about the topic at hand we're going to be covering halo spartan strike Mm -hmm. but yeah so it's a really interesting game that was kind of the follow-up to spartan assault about a year and a half later whether or not it's successful i think kind of speaks for itself but with that being said let's dive into the game itself Halo Spartan Strike is a twin-stick shooter and a sequel to Spartan Assault. It was developed by 343 Industries and Vanguard Studios. The game takes place in 2552 in New Mombasa on Earth, and then in 2557 on Installation 5, and has a total of 30 missions. The game would ship at $5.99 USD with crossplay for all Windows 8 devices. It could also be purchased as a bundle with Spartan Assault for $9.99 USD. The PC version of the game is compatible with an Xbox controller. And finally, it was released April 16th, 2015 on Windows 8, iOS, and Steam. And jumping over to the development of it, even though Spartan Assault debuted with lackluster success, Microsoft still pressed on with their Windows 8 exclusive efforts and looked to develop a sequel to the game. Even though Spartan Assault debuted with lackluster success, Microsoft still pressed on with their Windows 8 exclusive efforts and looked to develop the sequel known as Spartan Strike. In early 2014, Microsoft would announce that 343 Industries and Vanguard Studios are working on a sequel for Halo Spartan Assault titled Spartan Strike. So, you know, they're they're, they're trying to get this going and trying to have, you know, these other efforts going in that will allow for some different plays and stuff like that, like they're pushing Halo Wars and all these things to keep the Halo name going. And like we said, Windows 8 in and of itself was a recognized failure when it comes to like PC platforming. It was a weird mobile platform built to try and combat the iPad and other tablets around to have this centralized system that could work on a Windows tablet, a laptop, a touch laptop, PC. So. They needed something to go along with it to try and push that. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. I guess they, yeah, (laughs) they tried again for sure. Uh, They would once again partner with Vanguard Studios to develop the next chapter in the series. One of the first things that was worked on were the controls for the game, due to many fans and critics citing the controls as a point of dismay when playing the game. If you're playing on a touchscreen, when a player were to touch that screen, now an opaque yellow circle appears where their fingers are to represent the joystick. So if you're on your tablet, touch laptop, whatever, Mm -hmm. before it was just kind of, you just knew where it was kind of thing, and they were just, yeah, the, the, the movements and sticks were kind of there. This at least gives you an overlay, so you kind of get the feel of it mobile's hard to to describe in those terms but yeah you at least know where you're going so if you look down as you're, you're playing you can kind of tell which way you're going because this makes grenade throws much more accurate uh, for the player to be able to use mm-hmm. buttons wouldn't appear on the mobile version though the overall length of the game was also increased by about an hour or two with the overall size of the maps increased to compensate for that time. And as always, you know, as you continue to progress through the game, you'd stumble on these harder and harder levels that took those aspects of the game that you've learned and that you've come to know and keep mm-hmm. challenging the player. You know, this was a, a warranted thing that people wanted because they just felt in the OG that you kind of just 
went through it in a story mode almost and had that same enemy feel to it. And finally, each level would take roughly seven to 10 minutes or so to complete with the aforementioned 30 total missions in the game. Like the first game, players can use the in-game currency to purchase items before each mission. Fans weren't too terribly thrilled with the microtransactions in the first one, so they were cut from Spartan Strike entirely. In order to unlock the final five levels of the game, the player needs to obtain a gold medal on every previous level. The Warthog would make an appearance which wasn't in Spartan Assault. Unlike the traditional Warthog, this one didn't need a gunner in order to use the mounted turret on the back. It said players driving the Warthog, they could use the, the turret, aim, and fire it all at the same time. Yeah, which just made it, in my opinion, a better rate of play, especially mm -hmm. if you're just soloing it through and you want that full control of it, that's typically what your two-stick shooters would do. Like, mm -hmm. any vehicle you'd get in on, like, your mobile shooters or stuff like that, you want to make sure that it's, it's aftermost, a single-player experience with a sprinkling of multiplayer from that. That's that's yeah. typically what you want from those arcade shooters. So that improvement is, is in my opinion, one of the bigger ones that we see. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously we get a bit of balance coming in, you know, I guess you could say as much as they've learned from it yeah. for, for, you know, making a mobile app. Mm -hmm. They've definitely they've definitely put the time into it and, and listened to the fans. I think more so than some of the mainline games, but they put a little bit more, a little, little yeah. sprinkling. Like when they ordered their pizza, they did get the red pepper flakes this time, so they were allowed <laughs> to sprinkle it on themselves. It was nice. Imagine if they had put the Warthog in there, but you couldn't fire it. You could only drive it. Hey, I'm, I'm still a kill machine with it, so it doesn't matter either way. <laughs> The game was originally set to release on Windows 8 devices and Steam December 12, 2014. However, 343 Industries would eventually delay the game to early 2015 so that they could dedicate more time to fixing the Master Chief collection. Originally, Microsoft didn't mention an iOS version of the game whatsoever, but eventually they would decide to release the iOS version at the same time as the Windows 8 version and the Steam version as well. So, kind of like... Yeah, it's on Windows 8. It's also on iOS, I guess. Anyways. Well, and that's the thing, and, it, and it's tough to do because if any of you even see what's going on right now with Epic and Apple and, and what's going on in the courts, everyone knows that Apple charges so much to have some apps on the iOS store and do mm -hmm. updates. So they're trying to push Windows 8 at the time and, and to get people over to Microsoft's platform. But the reality is the more hands you get this in, the better it is for the rest of your products. Yes. I mean, this is an $8 app that ends, or six, $8 app, whatever, ends up combining to $10 for the bundle. Why not get it out there so that you can start making more money on, let's say, your aforementioned coming up Halo 5 that might have some microtransactions possibly in it <laughs> to kind of push that way. Yeah, but, but that was essentially the overall development of the game that we could find. There wasn't too much out there about this one versus Spartan Assault. But let's talk about what's new. What did they add in this game that wasn't in Halo Spartan Assault? So the first thing was being the Kestrel VTOL, which is a grounded hover vehicle that was actually originally intended for Halo Combat Evolved and Halo 2. And then we also have a teleport ability, which I think was actually kind of cool that you basically, it's exactly what it is, it's a teleport ability. And then we also have a mid-range reticle for improved aim. So before, you just pointed your gun and mm -hmm. hoped for the best. And you're, the only way you knew what was going on was the bullets themselves. Yes. But instead, now you have a dot that's you know halfway out there to show you, okay, you're kind of in range of what you need to do. Once again, some more of those quality of life improvements mm -hmm. that, that I think the studio definitely improved with as well to know the difference between everything they've created so far plus mobile games and... How can it work? Because once again, I'm going to keep saying this mobile game, it's first and foremost targeting a mobile and Windows 8 audience. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was on Steam. That is true. You can play with the controller everywhere. But first and foremost, it's targeting that mobile crew. Plus, like we said, it's a two-stick shooter. So it is targeting both. But yeah, it's definitely going to get that improvement going to just make it more of a fun arcade experience without the need of like skill in this point like it's yeah. just it's just a fun goofy game yeah and and really like yes they get harder but at the same time it's like it's still like a very passive game and that's you know as you said what it's meant to be mm -hmm. yeah it was just meant to be honestly a filler between games mm -hmm. it was yeah. kind of meant to be this thing that like we said pushed windows 8 a bit in having an exclusive for it for some reason 
and then to get people just on that Halo hype again. Yeah. That's really what we have. Now, Alex, can you please cover the marketing for us? Okay, Jesse, can you cover the campaign for us? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so, so there really wasn't any marketing on this. Yeah, other than, like, a press kit that yeah. was sent out to, to websites. I was like, this is the game. This is the plot. This is when it releases. I found more, mar- quote-unquote, marketing from just, like, demos of, of, like, Game Informer and IGN playing it and, like, talking about it, yeah. you know? And, it, yeah, it wasn't any uh, formal marketing, I guess you, mm-hmm. you would say. Like you said, it's more the press kits went out. If IGN or whoever had a slow week, they're like, I don't know, mobile team just cover slow week as in like nothing happened in the world yes. except for that. And they're like, <laughs> just just cover Spartan Strike, see what it's like, <laughs> you know, get something out there, get the clicks. Pretty I, much, I, I will say for the most part though, what I watched, a lot of people did enjoy it. I did too. I, I thought it was once again the quality of life improvement between them and having just something goofy to download. Be like, oh, there's a Halo game on here. Well, let's check it out. And you're like, mm-hmm. oh. That's mm-hmm. actually a fun little time waster. Mm-hmm. And it would be a great, it's a great mobile game to just like two stick shooter, have it out there. I I loathe shooting games on mobile. I want my sticks. <laughs> but if you just got like five minutes to kill or you're waiting for a bus mm-hmm. or something, it's a nice little time waster. Yeah. But let's talk about the campaign now for the game. So it, it actually jumps around in the timeline, but it starts in 2557. And like Spartan Assault, we're back on the UNSC Infinity. And it's we have the AI Roland who's talking to this unnamed Spartan 4. And so he's he's it's kind of like the first one, as I said, where it's like, oh, here's a training simulator where we're going to show you some of these battles that had been going on. And you, you can go in there and see whether or not you can prove better. Yeah, and, and Roland reveals, you know, that they'll be simulating the actions of an ODST squad called Alpha Five, sent into eh, secure. I guess is the best way to describe it. They're trying to get the Forerunner artifact known as the Conduit. Mm-hmm. And in this simulation, Alpha Five is actually just replaced by a lone Spartan. You're basically yeah s- taking them out and taking this unnamed Spartan and kind of just dropping them in and be like, mm-hmm. you know, you're just going to replace what they did, see if you could do it better type mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, and, and this is when it goes back in time to 2552 because now we're in New Mombasa because we're, when I originally heard about this game and I I saw that a Spartan 4 was going to be in New Mombasa because I, I was confused because in Spartan Assault, you're reliving that. Now it's doing this thing where you're just replacing them for the sake of the simulation. Yeah. So, you know, obviously that type of thing where it's, okay, you're going to figure out what happened with Alpha 5, but put in their place and simulating the actions that occurred around them. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so so during this battle, the Covenant brings in this Forerunner conduit into the city, and that's when a spirit dropship carrying information about the conduit is shot down by UNSC forces, and the Spartan has to go and recover the data pad from that spirit uh, with some intel. Mm-hmm. And then after that Spartan, your aforementioned Spartan, I'm going to keep using that word. I've used it way too much. The previously named Spartan. His name is Todd. Todd Spartan. <laughs> after Todd Spartan retrieves the data pad. They, they're they able to uh, locate over to where that conduit is set, and they figure out that it's elsewhere in New Mombasa. So they're, they're, they're like, okay, we can get to it. Let's go find out where this is. Uh, and we end up figuring out that the conduit, because it's, it's kind of this mystery that we're seeing in this data pad, like, okay, who's who's got it? Where is it? And it's revealed that the Sangheili that was carrying it uh, is actually killed. Uh, Greg Spartan brings the device to a nearby UNSC <laughs> convoy, uh, and that's when Greg... You know, it's, it's just like, hey, guys, got this for you. No big deal. <laughs> so, yeah, and then the Covenant obviously have now lost this very important piece of foreigner technology. So they assault the UNSC in hopes of getting it back. And during that firefight, a Zinghili field master escapes in a spirit after getting the conduit. Spoiler, mm-hmm. we're going to be talking about this conduit a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're basically trying to rewire their house. And, but there's only one conduit available mm-hmm. that can kind of route electricity for them. So it's a it's a big battle they're trying to get just to <laughs> just to update their 1950s house to kind of some modern electricity. <laughs> so your unnamed Spartan Todd or Craig or whatever Greg, whatever name we have for him, uh, pursues the dropship and it's shot down shortly afterwards. And that Spartan does eliminate the field master and all the Kigyar bodyguards. Mm-hmm. And, and once again, we get a scoop up that conduit. We go, man, can't wait to put a cool dishwasher in my house now that I've rerouted my power. 
Uh, so, but then they order the Spartan to escape. They're like, hey, stop bringing it to us. Get out of here. Go over to New Phoenix. We have this research facility over there. They can check it out, tap into it, figure out what's going on, and get some ideas. However, at that same time, the ship Solemn Penance is preparing to enter subspace over Mombasa. But yeah, and, and as as the Spartan Todd is fleeing with this conduit, uh, the slip space rupture takes him out and gets the conduit and, and the conduit disappears. So you're those technically those ODST don't make it out. Yes. And that's basically what we're saying is, is they're wiped out and then it, it kind of goes dark from there. Mm -hmm. uh, because once again, you're simulating what the ODSTs were doing. And like you said, the conduit's gone, but we don't really know what happens with it. It's just like boop, 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 memory done. And so like, yeah. that's kind of the end of that aspect of the simulation. Yeah, and in case you were curious, Roland does confirm, yeah, they died. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it goes back to 2557. And now, basically, five years later, the UNSC had never found it. And mm -hmm. so they were just like, it was probably destroyed. Like, it was just safe to assume. But uh, eventually, in 2557, a, a faint signal comes from Gamma Halo, and uh, Ivanov Station actually detects it. So mm -hmm. they're kind of like... Hmm, this thing that we thought was destroyed may not actually be destroyed. So they send a headhunter Spartan to go, you know, investigate. Yeah, figure out what's going on. You know, we get this anomaly. We know in Halo, if it's an anomaly, it's something you want. And a Spartan has to go investigate it. Yeah. So after they said the hunt headhunter in, it was discovered that the source was originating from the conduit. So so we're figuring out five years later, it's still around. And Jul Umdama's Reformed Covenant faction has also detected that signal and has sent a force to get the conduit themselves. However, the Spartan now jumps into there zoop, and heads into the action of the Headhunter during the Battle of Installation 03. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so to prevent the UNSC from finding the conduit, the new Covenant puts up all these signal jammers throughout the jungle, uh, as to where the conduit is actually located. Yeah, so so to be able to, you know, throw the scent off of it, make sure that comms can't come in, make sure that, you know, proximity stuff just won't work. And we've seen it plenty of times in the country. I will say signal jammer missions typically are filler missions, but solid nonetheless. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> signal jammer missions are, hey, your signal's jam. Go break those signal jammers. Mission done. All right, continue on with your mission. <laughs> And then we do see that as the Spartan destroys the jammers and the device, of course, is found soon after. Yep. And you find out that it, the conduit's in that forerunner structure. So you have to go in and destroy the power core with a wraith and you disable the gate that's blocking the entrance. So then all of a sudden now we get our favorite enemies on Earth, the Prometheans. Now we get into the foray of our two stick fighting. Mm -hmm. Of our robot friends. <laughs> our non-robot monster friends? That are robots. <laughs> so yeah, eventually, you know, as this battle ensues, the UNSC does pinpoint the location of the conduit. Which which we learn after we're fighting those Prometheans that actually Jewel and Dama just created this fake signal. Mm -hmm. And that's what we had been tracking the whole time. Bait and switch. But I love when it's like, all right, punch. Oh, look, there's the real one. Let's go find that. <laughs> it's just yeah, basically just type in a few few commands and you're like there you go easy as that mm -hmm. yeah so, so after we start to track that down uh, the Spartan departs in a pelican to the area of this signal and there we have a terminal and in that terminal we learn that the conduit is capable of opening forerunner slip space portals throughout the Milky Way uh oh so everyone's hunkering for some candy they want to get in there they want a Milky Way a Snickers some M&M's so this portal will allow them to jump into the candy bags of kids trick-or-treating <laughs> and swipe that candy. It's been the plan all along. I kind of want this now. I kind of figured out that's what this would be. I mean, it makes <laughs> as much sense as Halo 5 story. So, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so as we continue on, they, they discover this, and they also, they also realize that the conduit itself is kind of sentient in a way where it can activate its own slip space portal to escape danger, and that's actually how it survived New Mombasa. So it, it's it's basically, it's kind of like if you had to put a conduit into your house and get a new dishwasher and stuff. And this is exactly it because it opens slip space portals. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. 
if but, you think about it. And then imagine that dishwasher is like, I don't want to do this anymore, and just leaves. Yeah, and it happens. <laughs> I'd like to see that actually. It You're does. talking from experience. It no, sounds no, no. like it happens when it just breaks itself. <laughs> and then you gotta get a new one. <laughs> it's the exact same thing. But after all of that, the Jewel and Dama's Covenant discover an altar where they can use the power of the conduit. So they eventually power it up and they intend to open a slip space portal across Gamma Halo for basically just a quick transportation for all the Promethean allies. Yeah, to kind of get them over to where they need to go to wipe out any UNSC that's there and to really practice and figure out how they can use this conduit to jump in and out of battles, get mm-hmm. what they have to do, jump to really any coordinates they need. So it's obviously almost, a big, big bad boo-boo. It's almost like though that we watch the Prometheans already teleport everywhere. Yeah, but they don't teleport to you from across a halo. I can't confirm or deny that. I don't know what they were doing beforehand. I confirm all of it. <laughs> but yeah, so your your Spartan headhunter needs to stop Julem Dama's Covenant and get that altar from a pelican, but the the dropship is shot down. This is like the seventh dropship that's been shot down so far in this game, and it's a short game. It's tough. Uh, but, of course, surviving the crash, the Spartan fights past the Covenant soldiers and discovers a deactivated portal that leads to the altar. So... Who doesn't love a good plot line? <laughs> but yeah, so using some power stations nearby to activate the portal, the Spartan enters it and appears outside of that said altar. But eventually, the Spartan also uses a scorpion to get inside or get past all of Julem Dama's covenant defenses to get to that said altar. Mm-hmm. And, you know, after you destroy several nearby anti aircraft wraiths that were preventing the UNSC from dropping off. That tank that you needed. A pelican drops off that scorpion, and the Spartan uses it to fight their way to said altar. The Spartan kills all the Covenant forces at the altar and reclaims the conduit. Realizing that they have lost the battle, Ndama's Covenant forces begin to retreat from Gamma Halo. I I love the writing in this because it's an interesting story overall of, like, the conduit. That's a pretty powerful piece of tech. Mm Mm-hmm. I love that they're like, man, these defenses, impenetrable. However, we definitely death start it and basically left uh, weaknesses if a Spartan ever gets into a Scorpion tank, uh, we all <laughs> lose. So just make sure, that's why we're putting these anti-aircraft wraiths up, that a tank never gets de- it's delivered. All right, let's leave. We lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so eventually... The Spartan gets the conduit into a UNSC Pelican and then gets in a Covenant Spirit and leaves Gamma Halo. So once they return to Ivanov Station with that said conduit, the the uh, your unnamed Todd, Greg, Ted, whatever you want to call him. Greg S. Greg S. Uh, Spartan has an emergency distress call from an Oni facility on New Phoenix on Earth. Yeah, so... Uh- more than likely kind of the place you're going to be sent to originally mm-hmm. um, whenever those ODSTs were taking that conduit before they died. Yes. The Spartan learns that Jewel Madama's Covenant used that conduit at the altar to open portals in New Phoenix at the Oni facility. And now the uh, where these, these Forerunner artifacts are being studied. So now we have Prometheans and Covenant there attacking Earth. Mm-hmm. Directly in that facility, because as we figured out, a lot of this foreigner tech hums and talks to it each other. So more than likely, some of those pieces you're studying are like little gateways to and from the conduit. So mm-hmm. so it's more than likely what we're seeing happen throughout this. And so, yeah, like Jesse said, Julem Dama's forces and this Prometheans proceed to invade the city through that portal. And realizing that the conduit still needs to be shut down, you know, Spartan travels to Earth with the device to attempt to end this said invasion. Mm -hmm. In the end, the the Spartan and the Oni research team use the conduit to deactivate a Forerunner artifact at the heart of the complex that is generating all of the portals and it halts the invasion overall. And before the UNSC can reacquire the conduit, it kind of just does an automatic slip space jump and disappears. Goodbye. Plot armor. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, so to kind of summarize this, you know, we kind of bounced that around a little bit because these missions are cohesive, but in a way that mobile missions are. 
where it's, yes. it's very much one line, do this, one line, do this. But to give you a quick summary, you know, basically, once again, we are seeing 343 wrap in the idea that every game needs to be part of canon. So as we saw Spartan Assault, Spartan Strike adds that in, making it a simulation and, and mm-hmm. reliving events. You know, and, and I like the inclusion of you not having to be a group of ODST. You actually just basically you're Spartan yeah. in, that, in that first moment. So I thought that was pretty neat. And obviously, as that goes south... We lose them, jump five years, pick up a signal. Ju Umdamas, in full effect, has this new covenant going and, you know, has this, this alliance with the Prometheans at this point. Mm-hmm. Our Greg Spartan, going through as his headhunter, is making their way through to try and figure out where that signal originates from for, you know, the said conduit that we thought was lost. Yep. Battle after battle, going back and forth, we eventually recover it at the loss of knowing that all these portals had been opened, apparently. Blake Bortles portals, as they're called. (laughs) And and so we then know, okay, those portals are opened. They're getting their Snickers on Earth. We've got to go back and (laughs) rescue that candy. They make their way back. Portals are closed. Casualties are had. Because New Phoenix, man, they have had the brunt of everything. It's literally New Phoenix and New Mombasa that one time, and that's it. And they are just all these new cities, man. I'm gonna <laughs> stick with all the olds. <laughs> Old Phoenix is I'll stay with regular probably Phoenix. Safe. No, so 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 this occurs. We, we're obviously there. It, it's prevented. It slips away. And once again, this is kind of like a little nugget of lore knowledge that is just in there, where there's really no repercussion from it whatsoever. Mm-hmm. In terms of Halo lore, because like this kind of what happened, and then it left, and there's nothing that we know about it from there. So. I think overall with that, yeah, it's a lot of plot armor. It's basically like you're a barbarian, but now you have to wear all this armor to make it through this really cool thrashing story you're trying to tell. So it's, it's definitely there. And I think it is an interesting way to kind of push this mobile game yeah, and and have a story with it. Um, So like I said, overall, that's kind of the story you're looking at. You could think of it in the, the washing machine or, Dishwasher, whatever the hell I said, uh, analogy. That's a great analogy, by the way. <laughs> Keep that analogy in that head because that's that'll get you through life, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, like I said, it's it's an interesting game to play. It's it's a fun time waster, and it's a little 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 summary of the story for you. Yeah, but let's go on to cut material, and surprisingly, there's not a lot. But what they did cut was actually really big because they cut multiplayer out entirely. Yes, and like we said early on, you know, one of the big changes in and of itself with the Warthog was making it self-controlled. Mm-hmm. So instead of needing you know, a teammate or anything else to run it, yeah. you can run it yourself. And I think it's fine. I think once again, why put time and effort, that sounds bad, but why put time and effort into this mobile game to get multiplayer to work, to have yeah. servers for it, when you're already working on MCC, you've got Halo 5 down the pipeline, plus any other projects that you're really working on, Halo Wars 2, other stuff like that. Mm-hmm. When this is really just a mini cash grab, And kind of a marketing piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, of course, microtransactions were also cut entirely from the game. Exactly. Because, like I said, I think really what they figured out was this game in and of itself is kind of a wash. We're going to treat it as a Halo filler. It's, Mm -hmm. once again, candy analogy. You go to open up your bag and some crazy person in the neighborhood has put pretzels in there. Mm -hmm. Or like their mixtape. Like, you occasionally open up and you just see, like, a CD and you're like, what is this? And you're like, oh. We lived in different neighborhoods. <laughs> I would prefer that over pretzels. I got a few CDs every now and again. That is amazing. And here's the thing. It wasn't a demo tape or anything. It was just like a... A, a blank CD. It was like a Country Stars Christmas album or something. And you're like... That's fantastic. <laughs> I <laughs> wanted candy. I want a Jesse Christmas Halloween crossover where we just <laughs> listen to all the albums he's <laughs> taken from old neighbors. Oh, God. Who knows? I didn't take them. They were given well, to me. I don't know about that. <laughs> you got a lot of senile old neighbors. <laughs> True. But anyway, so yes. So, so this was, like we said kind of a little piece to give you, to tide you over until you had some more stuff to come about. I mean, you can even think of that in the way of the Halo novels. It's mm-hmm. it's a, a thing that gives you a real big insight to lore. It tides you over until a mainline game or a game that you want to play comes out and really keeps you interested. So I think mm-hmm. 
they tried to do that with this. They tried, but let's talk about the achievements. There are 20 total achievements. Certain achievements will actually unlock a nameplate, emblem, and an avatar that are Spartan Strike themed for the Master Chief collection. I've never seen those, and if you have those, please let us know. Yeah. I'm very interested. Players would also get in-game credits for unlocking those specific achievements. But overall, the most of the achievements are pretty straightforward. Just complete Operation A, B, C, and D. Yeah, and, and similar stuff that we see throughout MCC and other games that are kind of like, okay, in that same mission that you completed, you know, do this kind of bonus objective, whether it's mm -hmm. take no damage, prevent this enemy from escaping or, or doing this certain thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it adds it in there for those. And then you're also going to be seeing that we will have some skulls. So, so you got to go through and add some skulls in there. And of course. And basically... Mini, mini, mini last of the mission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it's just like you have your vid master challenges where it's like complete Operation A, Mission 6 with the blind and thunderstorm skull. So mm -hmm. things like that. And they also do have some achievements that are, you know, earn all gold stars in Operation A through E, which is something you'd have to grind through as well as spend 10,000 credits on loadout upgrades. Yes, a lot of that, like you said, is more of the grindy stuff and mm -hmm. getting through it. I mean, we see it in most every game, but they definitely put a little bit in there for those hardcore fans to get their full, you know, 20 achievements in there. It's it's a, it's a small amount, but you're getting it. You're mm -hmm. rocking through it. You're twin sticking it, as as, yes. as I say all the time. <laughs> twin sticking it. Everything. That's why I say yeah. But let's talk about the music, which is where actually a majority of the research went into mm -hmm. for this episode. Since composer Tom Salta's Spartan Assault soundtrack won a Gang Award for Best Original Soundtrack, Three Four Three Industries trusted Salta with almost whatever he wanted to do for this soundtrack. Salta had a head start on the game's soundtrack since he had already composed the first one. The first thing that he would do is try to create as many strong themes and motifs as possible for this new soundtrack. For the most part, all the tracks are brand new. When he first started working on it for the game, there were only a few unplayable levels built. It wasn't until the game was playable that Salta was able to get in and start figuring out how to implement the music into it. Like Spartan Assault, Salta would take weapons and sound effects and play them in the background while writing the music to see if it could really stand out in the midst of a firefight. Mm -hmm. From this, the music in the game actually is a little louder than it was in Spartan Assault. So we kind of saw that it was like the same thing in Halo 3 where they kind of quieted some of the weapons so you could actually hear Marty's music more. Yeah, and, and you can definitely see the implementation of that here and just to kind of keep the players in that realm of it. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're writing a horror movie, an action flick, a video game, you want to make sure that the sound is on point to keep that player enthralled and keep that that feeling of either triumph, downtroddenness, or, or whatever to keep it going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The soundtrack was recorded with the New York Film Choral and Macedonian Radio Symphonic Orchestra and features vocalist Jillian Aversa and guitarist Steve Oymet. Released April 18, 2015, the soundtrack contains 22 new tracks composed for Spartan Strike. And I want to wrap up the music section with a quote from Paul Lipson, who is the senior audio director at 343 Industries. And he says, quote, Tom continues to be a great partner for our franchise and has crafted a stunning musical offering that enhances the overall mix of the game and captures the sonic essence of the Halo experience. Yeah, and like we said... Really for this, like if you want any outcome or anything that really big came from Strike, I would say it is the music. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a soundtrack that I think really holds up that can be kind of put into mainline games. I, I definitely think it can dabble with it for sure. Yeah, I mean the biggest thing from I think that really came from Spartan Assault and Strike where people saying, get Tom Salta on Infinite. Yes, and, and we're going to kind of... Kind of come to it once again, a little bit of a shorter episode with this one. We're going to take a little bit of time at the end to kind of compare it to others and add mm -hmm. into it. But let's jump over to the general reaction of the game itself. Some are rather confused about the premise of the game starting in Halo 2. Playing as a Spartan 4, like Jesse said, during the Battle of New Mombasa. But the more the players went into the game, the more it started to unravel. Overall, critics felt that the game emulated Spartan Assault well, and that it felt like a Halo game overall. But... Cutting out the multiplayer, in their opinion, was a huge mistake. And we see that come through some of the scores. Metacritic mm -hmm. gave it a 66 out of 100 for PC, 
but on iOS, an 86 out of 100. And yes. I, I can agree with that. Yeah, well, it, it it's crazy to see the impact. Like, when you play it for the platform it was designed for yes. versus, uh, you know, on a PC with either keyboard and mouse or controller, mm-hmm. it's like night and day. But if you say, screw the critics, what do my peers think? Mm-hmm. Jump over to Steam. It's got a 9 out of 10. Once again, like I've said, this is a fun goofy little arcade shooter yeah within the halo universe so you're you're reskinning it i mean it's it's kind of like anything of all these old arcade cabinets that you can kind of play with and just like smash tv and a couple of others that are just this fun little arcadey shooter but obviously with a full story enthralled in it ign gave it a 7.2 out of 10 pocket gamer a 4.5 out of 5 and touch arcade 4.5 out of 5 once again it's in the mobile market in 2015 you didn't have much, in my opinion, that was incredibly standout-ish. Yeah, because for the most part, I mean, like I said with it before, I mean, you had a lot of shooters on here and a lot of these games that were really trying to figure out controls in that time point. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had simple games. I know Jesse and I were talking about like Angry Birds and stuff that was more just flick of the wrist type stuff, point, click. But when it yeah. comes to like actually maneuvering on your screen, in my opinion, there wasn't much crazy out there that drew me in. But having mm-hmm. something like this that could emulate that very well with that twin stick kind of shooter aspect of it, of button pressing and story mode and being at a reasonable price point, I, I think it did pretty well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the game really wasn't an overall improvement of Spartan Assault. For the most part, it played the same as the first game. Sometimes it was almost identical to it. It was clear, though, that 343 Industries and Vanguard could kind of recreate that gameplay of Spartan Assault but they couldn't really push Spartan Strike to make it feel like an actual sequel. Microsoft, for now, has since realized that a top-down shooter Halo title had potential. But unless they treat any future mobile titles with a little more earnestness, they will be doomed to relive the same fate as Spartan Assault and Strike. Though one has to give 343 Industries credit for trying something new and giving fans a Halo experience that was quick, convenient, and cheap. The only other real downside of the game was that Microsoft shut down support before it could ever be ported to either Xbox 360 or the Xbox One. Regardless, Strike is still a notable footnote in the long list of Halo media. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, Alex, let's sit back, relax, and let's have a discussion about how we feel about Halo Spartan Strike. Yeah, I mean, like I said over the episode, I think it was a pretty good mobile title that transferred to Steam and that was pretty fun to play. Once again, once you pop a controller on that, it's it's pretty fun. I, I like goofy little indie games, and this kind of fits that bill of just being a little bit of a time waster, something to play when you are you just need like a quick break from something. You mm-hmm. want to play for like 10 minutes or something like that. It's super nice. I think they can still transition this top-down aspect and do kind of what Gears of War Tactics did or XCOM or something like that. I think the Halo universe can lend itself to an aspect of that if they want to continue the top-down reality of it, transfer over to a D&D style, and make it more story-driven in those aspects. Mm -hmm. That's where I think you can take it. And I think think overall, if if you haven't played Gears Tactics yet... um, it was very niche. If you like your XCOM style, your turn-based D&D percentage style games, it's there. And I thought Gears was fun with it. And I thought that was definitely a gamble. And I think they're really pushing that in the Gears franchise, going with like a pop game and going with these other styles for it. I think that's Microsoft's testing ground right now. Yes. Is how does it work with them? Can we push it to pop a Halo? Well, I, th- I think it's like, you know, these were at one point testing ground for can we really take our mainline games and make them into a different kind of mobile thing kind of didn't work. Now they're trying some things with gears, which is a Mm -hmm. little more on top right now than halo. So it makes sense. Yeah. And that, that kind of came out and that's been some of their mainline stuff that got pushed. And so it's like, okay, can we expand on the story that we're doing? Can we try these different modes out that halo will steal? Cause that's what halo does to gears of war. (laughs) And, and can we keep pushing innovative and interesting elements Either one is a marketing piece Mm -hmm. to keep our mainline games going, or can it bring new fans in or bring even more casual fans in that don't necessarily need all the backstory on stuff. You're just like, okay, cool. I'm a Spartan in a training ground. Sounds good. I'll just just shoot stuff and finish missions. Perfect. But yeah, so I, I agree with that. 
I and for the most part, as I said, this was almost kind of like a carbon copy of Spartan Assault. I personally don't think 343 Industries wanted to do this. I think this was a Microsoft call 100%. Because I really couldn't find 343 Industries talking about it other than what they needed to. And once again, like we've said in it, this was a push for Windows 8 exclusivity. Mm -hmm. And I think that was kind of a silly play. I know Microsoft was like, man, we screwed the pooch on this one. How are we going to push Windows 8? It's got to be better than Vista. But you know we can't have the worst failure on our hands right now. So how do we how do we try and push this platform that no one wants? Yeah, and and really, it was kind of disappointing to see that like there was limited marketing for Assault, but Strike. I mean, as I said, that it wasn't being talked about. It seemed kind of thrown together at times. The story, as we said, is literally a, a fetch quest for this conduit. Really, yeah, that's really what it is. But overall, I say I will give them credit. They didn't literally push the Windows 8 tablet in er, in the the game like they did with Assault. Because remember, they're like, oh, you can play it on this tablet. And it's like, okay, guys. But really, as I said, it is something that's just fun to do. It's passive. Mm-hmm. You can be a little more hardcore about it when you're trying to, to get all of the achievements or spend 10,000 credits in the store. I do... Yeah, no, I started to jump in a bit. I do agree. I think it still brings a little bit of that difficulty that some Halo players mm-hmm. want and, and getting a little bit of a challenge. And once again with mobile games, getting your, your gold stars and you know hitting mm-hmm. time records and scores and stuff like that, it's there, but it at least increases the replayability. Yeah, and I, I am a little confused why they cut out the microtransactions because they weren't anything that, like, it wasn't a multiplayer where you're getting a bigger and better weapon. In in Assault, it was just you get better power-ups when you're playing the campaign. Well, you have to figure on 2014, 2015 was really the push against microtransactions, mm. especially on the mobile platforms. So... I think it's more of a PR move to not do mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Plus, once again, like I said, this wasn't a moneymaker for them. This yeah. was a, we need to push Windows 8. It's a bit of marketing. Just get something interesting out there that people can play. Yeah. I mean, as I said, it, at least, you know, for the first one, they did microtransactions well. They didn't make it into this game. And, I, and you know, talking to you now, I see why. So that's fair. But overall, it really was an interesting experience. And I mean... It is just, it's a story you don't have to know, but it's still there, and it's its its cool overall. I mean, I wish we could have known more about this, or maybe there was, like, a little more effort put into it to make it just a little more different and nuanced and something like that. Because I really think if they really dialed down on it, we could have something, like, that's really, really good. Yeah, um, you know, I think overall, like you said, it's out there. Play it if you want. Play it if you don't. Doesn't really affect your canonical experiences. No. Like, um, so I, I think majority of Halo fans would know what Assault or Strike are about, really. Yeah. But you know, rating the game, I'm gonna give it probably six and six point five or seven. And again, that's simply because it really was just a carbon copy for the most part of Assault. Oh yeah, if I had to give it something. I'd probably give it um, two years of home ownership. Add that in that you've been pretty happy having this home until divided by, I will say until slash divided by, you have to get a new conduit um, to replace some electrical aspects in your house. Now, add in that you you did get the washer, the dishwasher specifically, with the house, and that new conduit, it just fried it. So you have to now get a new dishwasher, and so you're going to have to add in that bill that you already had on top of purchasing that home two years ago. You're still kind of reeling from that. Your savings are going up, which is an addition. However, subtract the cost of a new dishwasher because you do want something that is good, but not fantastic. You just want something that can last you a bit. But then multiply that by just being happy that's taken care of. That equals a happy home conduit. That's what you need. <laughs> <laughs> Spartan Strike. Spartan Strike. But yeah, that was our coverage of Spartan Strike. Research was done by Jesse Reiners. Mm-hmm. And as of recording this, uh, yesterday, October 10th, uh, we did our eight-hour stream of Halo Combat Evolved on Legendary. Uh, so Jesse and I jumped in, 
had some laughs, uh, cried a lot, died a lot, but it was fun. And and we want to thank uh, the patrons for that. So that was yep. a Patreon goal we had of getting 25 plus patrons. Knocked it out of the park actually a couple months ago, way sooner than we thought we would. Yes. So we had to like jump on it, start getting streaming gear together, start getting a game plan for this and basically carve out a busy Saturday mm-hmm. within all our busy schedules to get this done. And I had a blast. Jesse had something. <laughs> I had a lot of emotions. <laughs> Jesse tried to give up three minutes before eight hours was done. <laughs> and I told him I would quit the podcast if he did. <laughs> uh, but overall, it was fun. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, I had a blast talking to chat, people who mm-hmm. signed up, you know, new subscribers, stuff like that. It was really, really awesome. But of course, if you are interested in our Patreon, you can check out the link provided below or any of the places that you're listening to this. And we got some really cool stuff on there. Mm-hmm. And one thing that we do have is shout outs. And I want to thank those patrons today. And we have Charles Zitter, Tactics, Skyjack, Francis, Harvey Chong, Brendan Reshitar, Anger Canadian, ZZ Slipaway, Grant Dillon, Duststorm, Mr. Choff, Cowan Fong Feliciano, Dragonfire, James Yervasi, Jonas, D Gamer1298, Alejandro Yarmil, Dilfix, Quantum Easy, that LL Gamer guy, Jamie Sneed, McCray Austin, Mega, Thomas Goulding, Nick Hyman, Tuna0317, Brendan Christian, Richard Scanlon, Let Me Be Frank, Mick Chief, Welsh, Big Papa Semichki, aka Big Papa, and finally Grant ODST. So we are growing. We are growing with that and want to thank you so much for the support. You know, Jesse and I truly, truly appreciate it. You've kept this podcast evolving. I mean, Patreon alone has allowed us to set up our stream Mm -hmm. to get some equipment running for that, to let us take some hours to really put more research into this and just get some really awesome stuff rolling out for you. Yeah, and we do appreciate it. And, you know, if you want to talk to us more about Patreon, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And after you give us a like, uh, send us a message on there. We are also on any and all podcast platforms. If you want to go on iTunes and leave us a starred reviewed or even a written review, that would be greatly appreciated. And most importantly, I'll take over Jesse's job because that's what I do. I'm here for you guys. He didn't mention we're on AM FM radio. Uh, we are also on that third record behind your grandpa's collection. So check us out there. I remember recording that. It was we, fun. We did. It was a good time. But realistically, we're on Discord. So check out our Discord um, if you haven't already. That's where you can really get into our terrifying minds of what we're producing. You know, get some insights and talk with some more fans. We also have a Patreon exclusive Discord channel where we share a lot more insights with you guys. What went on in research how we're doing, um, and then you can fuel our war. Do you prefer Monster or Red Bull? I don't like how you said Monster. Monster. Down with Monster, up with Red Bull. It gives you wings. Join it. Start our, start <laughs> our Avengers Civil War of dumb energy drinks. <laughs> that being said, that was our coverage of Halo Spartan Strike. Now, our next episode is going to be Halo 5 Part 1. I know a lot of people have been excited for that one, have been requesting it for Mm -hmm. some time. So in in two weeks, you are going to be getting it. So just stay tuned. It's going to be a blast. With that being said, I'm your host, Jesse Reiners. And I'm your host, Alex Kendall. And thank you for tuning in to Finish the Fight, a Halo podcast. Halo, it's finished. No, I think we're just getting started.